Ukraine is a mess. Don't blame Donald Trump for that. Well, you know, one minute. Come on. Okay. Ja, wir brauchen die NATO. Wir sind everywhere, from Lithuania to the Sahel, to Afghanistan, to Iraq, to Lebanon. War and Peace, a podcast by the International Crisis Group. Welcome back to War and Peace, a podcast of the International Crisis Group. I'm your host, Ola Olaker, here in my COVID home studio once again. And I'm Hugh Pope, the co-host for Olia, and I'm also in my home studio. With us today is our colleague Katya Quinn Judge, who is our senior Ukraine analyst for Crisis Group. We've talked about Ukraine in the past on War and Peace, and I think you are all very aware of the war that's been tearing that country apart since 2014. You may also recall that we at Crisis Group have begun a new series of publications on this conflict. The series is titled Peace in Ukraine, and its uh, different entries examine different components, uh, different problems, different possible solutions. Back in the spring, we talked to you on this podcast about the first publication in the series, Peace in Ukraine 1, A European War, looked at the geostrategic underpinnings and implications of the conflict. Today, we're really pleased to have Katya here to talk about two new entries, Peace in Ukraine 2, A New Approach to Disengagement, which we published in July, and Peace in Ukraine 3, The Costs of War in Donbass, which we launched in early September. Katya, First of all, welcome. Yes, thank you for having me. And uh, second of all, tell us, what's the bottom line of the disengagement report? Well, so this report set out to answer a pretty boring question that unfortunately people have been asking since at least 2015, which is why ceasefires in Donbass repeatedly fray. The sides have made dozens of recommitments to the ceasefire that was established first in 2014 and then in 2015, after the first one frayed very dramatically. And these recommitments in turn also fray. Violence is now, as you said, at, you know, at a slow simmer. It's a, at a much lower level. It, it's never reached the extent that it was in 2015, the last when they signed the Second Minsk Agreement. However, there has never been a real sustainable ceasefire at the front line. And this report sets out to answer the question why. And it challenges some conventional wisdom in that many say that the reason that the sides have not yet developed a sustainable political solution to the situation in Donbass, by which I mean the reason that the sides have not yet worked out what it would mean for the areas currently controlled by the separatists to rejoin Ukraine, what that would look like in terms of its administrative arrangement. So the conventional wisdom is that the sides haven't worked that out because there's no sustainable security situation. So first you have to work out the security situation and then you can deal with a political solution. But what this report argues that in fact is that in fact the absence of a sustainable political solution is hampering the establishment of a sustainable security situation because neither side actually sees that it has a real interest in ceasing fire altogether. Because as far as the sides are concerned, this would be a step into the unknown. It would be a step towards a solution that they don't even know exists. So that's the bottom line of this report. Okay, I'm looking forward to coming back to that. Um, but before we do that, can I ask you for the quick nutshell of the costs of war report? Yeah, so this economics report looks at a very dramatic phenomenon of the war, which is the fact that the front line runs between very densely populated or formerly very densely populated and heavily industrially developed area. And it's severed these links, this, these economic and social links that have been you know, so integral to so many people's lives for so long. And we ask what that looks like on a daily basis. A lot of people have done really great investigations about various aspects of the war's economic effects. You know, people have made attempts to quantify the level of industrial ruin that the war has brought with it. And people have also traced things like the advent of the illegal coal trade, by which you know, coal is smuggled out of separatist held areas through Russia into, you know, into Europe and Asia in some cases. But what we wanted to do with this report is really ask what these severed ties look like on a daily basis from the perspective of people living in these areas. Okay, well, I think this is going to be a really fantastic conversation. So let's go back to disengagement. When Volodymyr Zelensky took office as president of Ukraine last summer, he seemed to think that um, a ceasefire, just stopping the shooting, as he put it, was going to be the first step and really the key to ending the conflict. And in December of last year, he met in the Normandy format with uh, Russia's Vladimir Putin, France's Emmanuel Macron, and Germany's Angela Merkel. 
And they walked out of that meeting with new pledges, indeed, for ceasefires and disengagement. So what's happened since then? Have things gone as promised? Well, yes and no. So the sides agreed at that summit that by the end of March, they were going to agree on what they agreed to agree on three new zones of disengagement. And what are these zones of disengagement? These are areas that are two kilometers by two kilometers along the front line in which both sides withdraw bilaterally from their positions to create these very small demilitarized zones. So the sides were supposed to agree on three more of these, having established two that previous fall. However, the end of March came, and not only had the sides not agreed on these three new zones, but disengagement at the zones that had been established in the fall was already fraying. And this situation persisted more or less through the summer, so the advent of COVID meant that The sides stopped meeting for their bi-weekly meetings in Minsk and took these meetings online. It meant that the five crossing points along the front line, at which civilians can go back and forth, were more or less shut down, although they've more or less reopened. But I mean, what, what happened basically was that the whole urgency of fulfilling these promises that they'd made in Normandy had been lost. So as I say, this inertia persisted until late summer, at which point the sides finally agreed to recommit to the ceasefire. And now we're going on a ceasefire more or less holding, although I don't want to be too optimistic. Last year, after Zelensky came into office, a ceasefire was reestablished in June, and it took about 63 days, I think, for the level of violence to reach its previous level. However, what, you know, once it did, there was a huge sense of sort of demoralization on all sides, essentially. We thought that we were making progress, and here we are back at square one. So I, do, I don't want to be too optimistic. Katya, you talk about the ceasefire fraying on numerous occasions. Could you just give us a flavor of what that actually means uh, physically and also what you think the dynamics are that keep pushing this front line into this chronic state of instability? Okay, so I mean, an example. Last year, as I said, the sides recommitted to the ceasefire after Zelensky took office. And then and the recommitment was late June or early July. By mid-August, the ceasefire had frayed because two Ukrainian army engineers who were reportedly just carrying out some regular maintenance were killed by what the Ukrainian side said was an unprovoked attack. Um, After this point, the Ukrainian military couldn't really credibly make the case that it should continue to adhere to the ceasefire because there was a sense of public outcry and in a sense that here we are, we're the side that got invaded, and now here we are making concessions. And if we try to adhere to the ceasefire after this, then we're just making ourselves into total doormats, and we can't do that. Is there one side to blame or not? Right. So that's a very good question. The fact is that both sides blame the other, which is to be expected. And if you focus on certain indicators, both sides are actually right. What does that mean? You hear in Kiev and you hear largely from Ukraine's North American backers that the ceasefire violations are almost entirely on the separatist controlled side, or as they put it, the Russian backed side. And this is true if you look at two indicators, which are one, the number of heavy weapons observed outside of their mandated storage sites on each side. So when it comes to that indicator, then the Russian backed side is indeed the greater offender by far. Lots more heavy weapons, not where they're supposed to be. On the other hand, if you look at the OSCE's charts showing individual ceasefire violations, if you look at the direction of fire and you look at how many shots are fired west to east as opposed to east to west and, you know, southwest to northeast, for example, as opposed to northeast to southwest, then the picture is a lot more complicated. You see that the Ukrainian side is very lively participant in combat. We can also get a sense of the broader dynamics of what live combat if we look at civilian casualties as well. So roughly three quarters of these since the beginning of the war have been in territory held by the separatists. But then here it's dicey as well, right? Because we have the separatists saying, well, this clearly shows that they are hell-bent on destroying our civilians. And the Ukrainian side, well, I mean, it depends who you're talking to, right? Some people will outright deny that this takes place, that civilian casualties are greater on this side. They'll say things like, well, that's what the UN says, but they're heavily influenced by the Russians, or they're very naive, or that's what the OSCE says, but in the past, there's been a lot of Russian influence on them as well. However, you'll also have conversations where people will admit, in fact, that the preponderance of civilian casualties does occur in the separate 
Buddhist held areas. And then here the explanation will be that, of course, civilians in those areas end up getting killed because the other side is stationing heavy weaponry in populated areas. And this is much closer to the truth, right? The civilians in the separatist held areas will say openly, like, the troops in our areas are not making an effort to separate civilian and military objects. However, there's a but as well, right? Because when you talk to civilians on both sides, this is occurring. It's more likely to occur on the separatist held side because there are more civilians there and there are more populated areas there. So the way the line is positioned, it cuts off these densely populated suburban areas from areas that are a little bit further out from these major cities. So the cities of Lugansk and Danetsk, the major cities of the two oblasts, are now in separatist held areas. And the areas that are on the Ukrainian controlled side of the line are sort of are less populated suburban areas a lot of the time. So again, that has a huge effect on the dynamics of the conflict. It means that on the one hand, the separatists are more likely to station heavy weaponry in populated areas. And on the other hand, the civilians who die are more likely to be the ones on the separatist held side. So you started off by telling us that the bottom line of this report is that the idea that if you can just stop the shooting, you can negotiate peace, has it backwards, and that you need to negotiate some aspects of peace before the parties will stop shooting, uh, at least for very long. So why? Uh, why are the two sides unwilling to stop shooting without a deal? Well, that's a very good question. Different people have their different motivations. When it comes to the de facto authorities of the so-called People's Republics, otherwise known as the separatists, otherwise known as the Russian proxies, these are people who have, in many cases, amassed a good deal of wealth through some very shady scheme in the past few years. You know, they've gone, in some cases, from total obscurity to being multimillionaires. And they're people who don't want to see these newfound sources of earnings cut off suddenly. And that's what would happen if these areas were to reintegrate into Ukraine. Not only would they lose their newfound sources of earnings, but if these areas were to reintegrate into Ukraine in a way that really sort of meaningfully respected Ukrainian sovereignty, then one should expect that these people would no longer be in their positions of power and they would no longer have access to these newfound sources of illegal income. However, perhaps even more compellingly, these people, if the so-called republics reintegrated into Ukraine, would be subject to prosecution, and they don't want that. When it comes to the issue of prosecution, um, the number of people affected by that fear is greater than the number of people who simply don't want to lose access to new earnings. Okay, so this explains really well why the war continues. But why is it a problem to pull back forces and to stop shooting while you sort out, well, who keeps what wealth and what amnesties and what prosecutions are going to go forward? The war looks very different depending on where you see its center of gravity is being located. If you see the center of gravity is the line of separation, so that the front line in Donbass, then Ukraine is the stronger force, right? It has more troops on the front line than the separatists do. But if you see the center of gravity of the conflict as the Russian border, which many would say is a much, much more accurate way to view it, then it's the Ukrainians that are outnumbered because there are tens of thousands of Russian troops stationed in southwestern Russia who would hypothetically be ready to cross the border and back up the separatist troops in the case of some sort of threat or in the case of some sort of high alert situation. So both sides can claim that they that they feel threatened and that they feel outnumbered. All right. Everyone feels threatened and outnumbered. But again, why not stop shooting? Why not disengage in just a few key areas? So as one person who participates in the Minsk talks put it to me, it's not enough just to say stop shooting. You have to know why you're stopping shooting. And at this point, people really don't know why. As I said earlier, if they don't see a political solution that they're working towards, they find it very difficult often to step back from this mentality of defending the land that they're standing on and fighting to avenge their friend. There's a lot of inertia when it comes to day-to-day -day battles. People obviously have a hard time backing away from this feeling that they need to defend their land and that they need to continue to avenge those who have died before them. And this is incredibly hard to step out of this mentality if you don't have a very, very clear motive for even for creating a small demilitarized zone. So an idea that we put forth in the report is that the logic of disengagement needs to be slightly shifted. Creating these small demilitarized zones shouldn't be seen necessarily as a first step towards broader political regulation, but rather it should be seen as something with very clear humanitarian goals that will make life easier for civilians living in the vicinity of these demilitarized zones. An example that we have so far of actually like rather successful disengagement was the disengagement at the Senitsa-Lugansk bridge that occurred last June 
when the sides step back from an area adjacent to a civilian crossing where some 10,000 people cross each day. And stepping back from the bridge allowed the Ukrainian side largely to renovate this bridge and to turn it from an awful, you know, broken object that people had to kind of clamber across, like a paved bridge that people could walk across comfortably. So here there was a real impetus, right, for people to sustain this zone of, of disengagement. But with the other disengagement zones, there hasn't been the same clear humanitarian impetus. So that's one thing. But then another reason why the sides have had so much trouble agreeing on zones of disengagement has been that the sides have tended to use discussions about disengagement is a way to cement their own narratives of the conflict. So what does that mean? It means that on the separatist side, we see the separatists at times trying to insist on disengagement in areas that they are occupying counter to the Minsk agreements. One example is the city of Dybaltsova, which they seized after the 2014 Minsk agreements and were supposed to withdraw from after the 2015 Minsk agreements, but haven't done so. So they put forth a suggestion to disengage around a village called Rasadkye, which is near Dybaltsova. And as the Ukrainian side sees it, and as other arbiters in the conflict see it, this was essentially a bid to legitimize their claim over Dybaltsova. Disengaging at Rasadki would not have had any real um, military or humanitarian benefits. It would have just been a way to cement their narrative of who can lay claim to what. On the Ukrainian side, the logic is rather more basic. It's essentially that this is all Ukrainian land and that there's absolutely no sense in us withdrawing bilaterally when this is all our land. So it's much more of a sort of blanket, sort of principled opposition to the idea of disengagement. That you don't retreat on your own soil, that you don't legitimate somebody else's claims on your land. Right. No, exactly. And this is made more potent by the fact that in late 2015, and really a process that picked up steam in sort of late 2016, 2017, and continued throughout 2018, the Ukrainian side managed to carry out a creeping offensive, which basically amounted to the Ukrainian side taking back a few sort of small villages and hamlets along the front line. But this, for some people, had enormous symbolic value. And the idea that disengagement could, in some places, result in the Ukrainians stepping back on areas that they had actually won through battle in the past few years was incredibly unpalatable to a lot of people. Katya, is the humanitarian imperative really strong? I mean, can people see that people are suffering greatly along the front line? Well, I mean, can people see that people are suffering greatly along the front line? And is the humanitarian imperative really strong or two different questions? There are some Ukrainian media outlets that do still try to center the humanitarian issues. But generally, on a day-to-day -day level, it's not on a lot of people's radar. And say that. That said, the humanitarian imperative is very strong. There is, for example, the Donetsk filtration station, which is in an area that's now basically no man's land, and it provides clean water to 345,000 people approximately on both sides of the line. And the filtration station regularly has electrical wires that, essential to its functioning, you know, damage through shelling. Its workers are regularly subject to small arms fire when they carry out repairs. This is really crucial civilian infrastructure that would benefit greatly from besides disengaging there. So, I mean, that's one example of very strong humanitarian imperative. But at this point, there's no sign that the sides are actually willing to disengage from this object. So, I mean, you could say that sometimes, in some cases, the stronger the humanitarian imperative, the greater the obstacles to disengagement. War and Peace, a podcast by the International Crisis Group. You're listening to War and Peace, and Hugh and I are talking to our colleague, Catherine Quinn Judge, about two new Ukraine reports. So, Kat, so this conversation we've been having about humanitarian imperatives, I think, segues us nicely to the Costs of War report. And you've been traveling for years around Ukraine, talking to people who live in government-controlled Ukraine, talking to people who live on the territories that are now controlled by these self-proclaimed republics. And I want to know how the war is affecting them economically and socially. Because I remember when you and I traveled um, around government-controlled Donbass uh, – a bit over a year ago, and we were visiting these towns, these towns that used to be suburbs of Donetsk City, say, and now they're cut off from that. Donetsk City is controlled by the self-proclaimed republics, and the suburb has become a town, but with none of the infrastructure of a town, right? No libraries, no bookstores. It's just not set up to be an independent place. And the closest Ukrainian-controlled urban area with all that infrastructure is really quite far away. So I'm wondering, is that typical or is that unusual? Yeah, no, so that that is very typical. I mean, that's an interesting phenomenon of, of this war, that 
areas that were sort of backwaters have now risen to prominence along the Ukrainian side of the line. Because as I said earlier, the major cities of the oblast, Donetsk and Lugansk, are now in the separatist held areas. So the provisional capitals of the two oblasts are now in Kramatorsk and Severodonetsk, which were not obscure, but a relatively sort of just provincial industrialist towns previously. The new prominence of these of some of these areas along, you know, that are now sort of frontier towns along the front line is really it's a double-edged sword. Some people, including some youth, really feel that the new status of their cities has led to real improvement in their quality of life. You know, as one resident of Slavyansk, whom I cited in the report, you know, she said before the internationals were here, there was nothing but dive bars, nothing but just like just places for people to go and get wasted. That was all there was. And, for example, I have a friend who runs a sort of small education center in Slavyansk in this sort of somewhat dreary, like really, um, industrial city where youth can now come and learn about sort of experimental music and making music from found objects and German language lessons, things that they weren't necessarily part of the landscape before. That said, the new status of these towns, as you alluded to, it's also created a lot of challenges. Um, you know, one clear example would be the town of Starabilsk, which is, you know, sort of a sleepy uh, district seat on the edge of a rather agricultural area. And the Lugansk University split in two when the war began. So some people decided to stay in the separatist held areas for whatever reasons. And some people decided, no, I have to get out. And the people who got out moved to Starabilsk. So this kind of, you know, the small sleepy seat ended up hosting a university and it put a lot of strain on the town's infrastructure. Internally displaced people also ended up flocking to the town, which also it strained the infrastructure in a lot of ways. Some residents of these areas complain about new competition on the job market as well, which is, it's understandable because you have people coming from these fairly metropolitan areas to these smaller areas, and they're now competing for jobs. And in many cases, they're really tough competitors. So this has brought new social tensions as well. On the other hand, obviously, there's ineffective enrichment by these newcomers. In another town, county seat, Novopskorov, there is a just one example, a woman who is a well-regarded neurologist who now provides high-quality ultrasounds in this sleepy town that are beyond what the local hospital can actually provide. It's interesting. It's a mixture of sort of pluses and minuses. How about on the other side? They rebelled against uh, central government in Ukraine, obviously expecting better things from a closer alliance with Russia. But are they feeling any positive winds of uh, economic uh, resurgence that you, you seem to be describing from the Ukrainian side? We have to be careful about saying that they rebelled against the central government in Ukraine. I mean, crisis group has never been one to completely dismiss the idea of some grassroots support for the so-called people's republics, but we have to be very careful about acting like it was a real grassroots movement. I mean, I think it's more accurate to say that people didn't welcome the events of Maidan. They were very confused by them in some cases, and that when people started coming across the border and making trouble, they basically kept their head down and, and yeah, and hoped that something better would come out of it. And no, I mean, the short answer is no. There's very little sign of people feeling that these new realities are better than the old ones. Okay, so the stereotype is that everyone who was capable and educated left and moved to government-controlled Ukraine, where they, well, they compete for jobs and create tensions, but they build their lives. But that means that one narrative that you sometimes hear in Kiev and elsewhere is that everyone who's left in these so-called people's republics, they aren't the people Ukraine needs. They're not loyal. They're not useful. Is that the sense you get when you talk to some of these folks? There were a lot of complex calculations that went into the decision to stay or go when these so-called republics took hold. I mean, is it fair to say there were some people who were hoping that with a degree of sort of integration into the Russian economy and the Russian system, that their industrial economies would be revived? By that same token, there were a lot of people who harbored no such hope because they could look across the border, say, to mines in the Rostov Oblast and see that they had been, quote unquote, optimized over the last decades. Which means they no longer function. Which means that they no longer function in most cases, yes. Many of the people who stayed were delighted with the events of Maidan or didn't really get what was going on, were very disoriented by the sort of contradictory information coming out of Kiev and didn't necessarily 
weren't like overcome with a desire to flee to free Ukraine, as some people put it. But as I say, yeah, there were a lot of different calculations going into people's decision to stay or go. I mean, just one example that I felt was very eloquent. It was a young woman I met in a hostel, probably about my age. And she said that when the war began, her grandmother was bedridden and dying, so she didn't want to leave. And she and her family told her grandmother that the sounds that they were hearing outside the window were just roadworks because her grandmother had been born in the war and they didn't want her to die in the war, or at least to feel like she was dying during a war. So she stayed there until her grandmother died, by which point she had had a friend who had been shot trying to cross over into Ukraine and felt very frightened at the idea of even trying to make the crossing. Now, I met her in Mariupol, in government-controlled Ukraine, in 2018, and I think this was one of the first trips that she'd made to the government-controlled areas since the war began. And yes, she wanted to make the switch and she wanted to come over to government-controlled Ukraine, but by this point she already had a whole bunch of problems with lapsed documents because she hadn't been able to cross the line. She also now had a cosmetology business where she had a lot of equipment that she had just recently bought that she didn't know how to transport over the line. Because there are all sorts of restrictions on what you can and can't move. Right, yeah. I mean, so there are these different sets of family loyalties, like a sense of duty to family members. And then as, as time goes on, there are other considerations that people have to take into account. And so it doesn't necessarily mean that a person isn't a self-starter, or that a person isn't loyal to Ukraine, or that a person likes these separatist authorities, if they're still there. As I say, for so many people, it's just so many different calculations that they have to consider and juggle. So Katsu, you're telling a story in which, um, in government-controlled Ukraine, it's not so bad. And in some cases, you're actually seeing this rebirth uh, in places that haven't seen much development or investment for quite a long time. And in non-government controlled Ukraine, it's pretty bad. But perhaps if I'm sitting in Kiev, that doesn't seem like the worst case scenario, all told, because yes, I probably feel bad for the people in the non-government controlled areas. But I also think that perhaps this reality that they're suffering will bring them well to their senses and force them to realize that life is really much better under the Ukrainian government. So surely I'm thinking along these lines, that means the path to peace, whether it involves reintegration or not, might just be to wait this out. And if reintegration happens, well, you can do it on the model already developed and implemented for government-controlled Ukraine, um, all of this rebuilding and investment. And if it doesn't happen, well, Ukraine is isolated from the damage, the harm, the economic backwardness that keeps getting worse in these non-government-controlled areas. What's wrong with this viewpoint? Right. Well, so I would argue that that story basically presupposes that the likely outcome is that they don't get the territory back. It's very hard to picture people in what are now the separatist-held areas really feeling inclined to try to throw in their lot with rejoining Ukraine if they don't feel like the government is trying to even sort of envision a future of which they're a part. And a huge component of sort of envisioning a future of which they're a part is trying to at least restore or even sustain some excellent economic ties. I would argue that people who say that we should just let the areas wither on the vine are generally people who believe that is one journalist who recently got out of a long spate of detention, in the DNR put it, who believe that these areas are lost, essentially. So the problem with the idea of just letting these areas wither on the vine and putting all the energy into sustaining the economy of government-controlled Ukraine, more years going by and more degree of decay and the degree of, in many cases, resentment among the local population in these separatist-held areas is only going to deepen. So if Ukraine did end up taking these areas back, it would find a degree of you know, industrial ruin, environmental ruin, you know, in many cases, you know, even environmental catastrophe due to the effects of mines being flooded, which is something that's ongoing in these areas already, that would be incredibly hard to deal with. So one of the arguments against reintegration today is that these areas need so much help, right, that Ukraine can't currently provide. But the point is that the degree of help that they're going to need is only going to grow. The problem is only going to get bigger. And the fact is that as the years go by, the population is going to become less sort of inclined to reintegrate as well, because they're going to be either, you know, either so resentful or so simply accustomed to this new, very grim normal 
that it's going to be very hard to untangle all these processes. So Katya, what is the right way forward? That's a very difficult question. And I think one thing that I actually like about this report is that we don't try to provide a set answer. We simply try to provide a very detailed account of what things look like today. However, there are a few recommendations, and these involve ways, say, to stimulate small-scale trade across the line of separation, which is already happening and which has been happening for the past few years, but largely on a sort of semi-legal basis. So in December, Kiev lifted weight limitations on cross-line shipments for individuals. And then the question is now how to take advantage of these lifted weight recommendations and to actually to really sort of stimulate a greater degree of cross-line commerce. There are many variables involved here. One of them is just that many on the Ukrainian side also don't believe that, that this sort of commerce should be encouraged because the idea is that relations with the non-government controlled areas should remain entirely humanitarian based and not commercial. Another issue is that the separatist authorities have not necessarily reciprocated and are not necessarily actually trying to ease cross-line trade either. Currently, the sort of shadow trade that goes on is a huge opportunity for corruption, obviously, because, well, for obvious reasons, right, it's not legal, so you pay people off and a significant number of people have become rather accustomed to these corrupt payoffs that they get. So then the question would be, is there a way to sort of stimulate cross-line trade that would not simply result in a sort of different, in an expansion even of this sort of corrupt system of payoffs, just in a slightly different form? Okay, so what are our specific recommendations? Well, so we recommend essentially that the sides come together, that the sides find a way to around some of the legal conundrums, making it difficult to trade across the line, and that the sides also try to harmonize their regulations in terms of what people can bring across the line. We also recommend that Kiev even consider perhaps offering some incentives for companies that were interested in doing trade across the line of separation to hire locally as well. Because one of the concerns among some locals is that, for example, in Stanitsa Luganskaya, which is on the Ukrainian-controlled side, small farmers like to sell their produce across the line on the other side. And there's concern among some of these farmers that some large company from Kharkiv or Kiev could just come in and, and basically edge them out. And so one of our suggestions is working out ways for companies that did trade across the line to hire locally so that, that these local people who are now dependent on these, this form of cross-line trade didn't end up losing out. Katya, this has been a really interesting conversation. And as always, there's a lot we didn't get to. So I'd like to encourage all of our listeners to learn more by reading the two new reports, Peace in Ukraine 2, A New Approach to Disengagement, and Peace in Ukraine 3, The Costs of War in Donbass, which are, of course, available for download on our website, um, and also available in um, not only English, but also Russian and Ukrainian. I think this work reflects some really tremendous research and analysis by our Ukraine team. So Katya, thank you so much for all of the work you've put into this, and thank you for joining us on this podcast. Yes, thank you for having me. In addition to reading our report, available on our website, www.crisisgroup.org. You can get real-time insights on Ukraine by following Katya on Twitter. She is at K-Q-U-I-N-N-J-U-D-G-E, at K Quinn Judge. You should also follow Crisis Group itself and Hugh, and you should follow me on Twitter. Crisis Group is at Crisis Group. Hugh is at Hugh underscore Pope, and I'm at Olya Oliker. No underscores, no dots, none of that. Also, check us out on Facebook and Instagram, which is also at Crisis Group. Also, feel free to tweet at us about what you like or don't like in the podcast. We will be paying attention and we will be listening. If you're listening through iTunes, do consider leaving us a rating and a review as well. War and Peace is part of the Europod network. Check out some of their other podcasts on a variety of Europe-related topics. And big thanks to producers at uh, Bull Media and to Miranda Sunnox, our coordinator, who keeps the podcast trains running. And our biggest thanks always go to you, our listeners. We look forward to chatting to you again in two weeks. Goodbye. And it's goodbye from me too. Uh, Hugh Pope signing off from Brussels. War and Peace a podcast by the International Crisis Group.